Thank you for having me. It's a uh, it's great having you here, and I love starting these podcasts and these chats by um, trying to understand the layer of the person. Um, so, could you share with us maybe a bit about your upbringing, some early influences in your life, and where you grew up? Sure. So I grew up in Russia, in Moscow. Okay. And I actually got asked this question the other day around what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I moved here when I was about eleven. Up until that point, I wanted to be a ballerina. So growing up in Russia, I was doing ballet. I was really into piano. My mum was a piano teacher. Um, my dad was a nuclear physicist, so none of that translated, though. I'm not very good at wow. <laughs> anything related to um, physics. But I was very much into, you know, kind of arts and, and so on. And I wanted to be... Um, did I say I wanted to be a ballerina? You did, yeah. No, sorry, I actually, that's wrong. I want to be a princess. Princess, okay, even better. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I um, Princess was because I had this thing in my head that princesses don't have to do any chores because I was made to do lots of chores as a very young child. So I was kind of like, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to have, you know, a butler do everything for me. That all changed when I came to Australia. I um, got heavily into sports, so I started playing cricket, um, football and ended up getting really um, passionate about basketball so I wanted to be a professional basketball player and whilst I didn't achieve that goal I still play a couple of times a week with two teams locally so I still get to kind of you know follow that um, somewhat dream but it was never expected to be doing this when I was a young child for sure. That's amazing and um, what about your education as well um, in university what did you study there? Uh, there was no university. Amazing. I dropped out yep. in year eight. Okay. Yeah. Wow. What, what was the catalyst for that? I had a job at Hungry Jack's before the legal age of working and I was really, you know, um, orientated to make that thing $6 an hour it was, was what we got. So I kind of was really keen to work. I also still wanted to keep up my studies. So I actually selected a TAFE course um, when I was um, 15, mm. so I wanted to do something where I could choose a subject. So I was doing business admin, but I stopped going to high school at that stage. So I was more focused on working and studying at TAFE. Sure. What was the experience like? Because for a lot of people, uh, there's often this fork in the road where they go, should I continue my education or should I take the path that you know a lot of successful founders seem to have taken, which is dropping out of school at yourself and, and starting work at an early age. What was that experience like? And any advice for people currently at that crossroads from yourself? I think it depends on what's driving you. For me, I really wanted independence. I actually left home at a very young age as well. So I was, if, you know, something like saving money for a house is your kind of, you know, goal, staying with your parents and, and probably staying in school might be more of a um, good choice for yourself. For me, like I said, I was really impatient. I hated sitting and learning in a classroom. So I wanted to just get on it and learn on the job. I actually, um, during the TAFE course, we had an exercise to find a job to apply for and pretend to apply for it. I actually went for it for real and got a traineeship at the Colesmire head office um, at 15. So they'd never, ever hired anyone younger than 16. Wow. Um, but yeah, so I was kind of accidentally got in there, continued my studies because they let me work and continue the studies on the side. So I think that you can just go for it. There's no... Um, you know, nothing to lose there. And if that doesn't work out, then you go back to what you were doing before. But I'm not saying people should drop out of school by any means. It worked out for myself. Yep. Um, but if you find yourself really, really interested in learning on the job, you could also volunteer. I can talk about that later if you like. But that really skyrocketed my career because you can learn something without actually um, having the pressure of being in that job and, you know, potentially not performing and getting in trouble because you're a volunteer and you're there to learn and people are there to support you. And there's no expectation um, you know, as much of an expectation as in a paid role. That's really inspiring. Wow. Mm. I don't Thanks. think I've met many people uh, who've gone through that same journey. So huge kudos uh, to yourself and for where you've gone to today as well. Thank you. So you've taken on uh, a bunch of different roles as well over time. Uh, marketing manager at Ensynergy, uh, marketing manager at Jasco, Redify, all these different companies. What was the experience like going through all these companies? And do you have any key takeaways from that? I guess the pre, pre-work 180 period of your life. Um, that's a very interesting question. I suppose I, now that, you know, I'm kind of talking about it um, in, in an orderly fashion, so to speak, again, following that same mentality of just going for it. So the first role at um, in Synergy, who are now Live Tiles and actually one of our clients, back then there were only, I think there was the two managing directors, the co-founders and just a couple of tech guys. I was the first female in that group. I... Um, started there with no background at all in technology. They wanted a marketing manager slash kind of PA. 
and my first two weeks were very um, challenging because my boss at the time said to me, um, I'm going to New York and your job is to launch SharePoint. I don't know if you guys know SharePoint. Yeah, yep. just a tiny, massive, massive product. <laughs> launch SharePoint and this is... <laughs> This is probably 12 years ago, so whatever version of SharePoint that was. And he said, I want 100 people at a launch at Microsoft in Sydney. Wow. My first question was, what the fuck is SharePoint? Yep. And his answer was, the less you know, the better. <laughs> he went away. We made the launch happen. And so it was kind of learning. Um, it was a baptism by fire is an expression that people use. After that, I guess my pathway continued in just yeah again learning on the job putting a hand up for things always meddling in things in a way asking lots of questions and then getting responsibility for that particular area I'd say that's probably how I've progressed over the years back you know 12 years ago and so on. So you launched Work 180 initially as Diversity City Careers back in 2015 and this was after you've gone through a bunch of different jobs in different companies and different technology companies so what what inspired you to start uh, at the time Diversity City Careers? What so there's a mix of different things, but we all have our personal drivers. So for me, um, what we didn't really talk about was the fact that I was a mum throughout that whole time. Okay, yeah. So I had my son very young and it was very, uh, back then there was no paid parental leave from the government. And even though I worked for a giant company, there was also no flexible working and so on. So I had to come back pretty much immediately after he was born because I was the main breadwinner. And um, it was very tough because my son um, wouldn't take formula. So... I couldn't stay home, obviously, but he had to be physically brought into the office to breastfeed and there was no breastfeeding rooms available. So, mm. yeah, um, it was a thousand odd people in that office and I had to beg my way into the doctor's office every lunchtime to keep my baby fed. And that was really stressful. So I guess it, even back then, um, you can probably understand why I'm so passionate about asking the questions that we do ask now, such as how long paid parental leave do employees get? What's the minimum tenure required before they can access that? Is there breastfeeding rooms? Because, you know, coming back to work after a baby is a completely different scenario and there's so many things that employees often don't think of as well. So um, further down the track, I, um, my son was diagnosed with a disability, so he's got cerebral palsy, and it became really difficult as a single parent to find work that was both flexible so I couldn't continue my career and look after him. So again, I kind of hit a wall in between those roles that you described. I'd often apply for jobs and then be knocked back because they'd want someone in the office nine to five, whereas I needed something um, where I could pick my son up and drop him off because I had no family support. Um, so something more within school hours. And funnily you know, enough, in Synergy, the first role in IT, actually were looking to hire somebody 10 till 2. And as they grew, I was able to do more work at home. So working with the London office, for example. So if it wasn't for that opportunity, who knows where I would be right now? You know, So it's at that point that I became really, on a personal level, um, understanding the problem that a lot of other people face because there's so many carers out there and even just parents that are trying to get back to work but not wanting to give up, you know, time with their children, so to speak, and, and so on. And um, at the same time, my co-founder and I were also volunteering with Females in IT and Telecommunications, or FIT for short, and that was a large organisation with about 4,000 women in technology. And through that volunteering experience, we also came across lots of amazing you know, companies that were really supportive of women in technology and who put in they extra went the extra mile to support them. So we suddenly, you know, got to see that not all companies were created equal. Mm. Through my personal experience, Gemma, my co-founder, also worked for some archaic boys clubs. So that's where the idea was born. It was around um, Gemma had the idea originally was what if we had a job site which pre-screened which companies are supportive so that women like myself and like Gemma and all other women around us um, and men as well who use the site to figure out who's more supportive than others wouldn't have to be wasting their time and also having their, you know, um, courage shattered at the end of an interview because there was nothing in place for flexible working, for example. And could you talk us through how you and Gemma over the years have grown as co-founders as well? Because what I find interesting in your dynamic with Gemma is that both of you are co-CEOs of, of Work 180. And that's not something that you see very often. And for, for those companies that you see adopt a co-CEO structure, it's often very difficult uh, to make that work. So what's the dynamic between you and Gemma like? You know, I think, I'm not sure at which stage these companies are adopting that structure, but I could imagine trying to make two people, well, actually, I don't know what I'm basing it on. So I was about to say, I'd imagine it'll be difficult to get people in at a later stage to job share that role. Um, but in fact, I strongly believe in job sharing, especially at senior level. However, 
my point is that Gemma and I kind of both grew from the very beginning and I think that is a completely different dynamic and maybe why it works so well um, because in the beginning it was just us doing everything mm. that we now have a team of nearly 50 doing so we know firsthand everything except developing you know yeah. <laughs> the site so to speak what each role entails and therefore um, it's it's I don't know it's been really I don't want to say easy in terms of easy making decisions together but we've never really um, We've always been had diversity of thought in terms of we didn't always agree with each other, um, but the way that we worked out the best path forward had always been amazing in the sense of we all have something different to bring to the table. Um, if one person feels more strongly about a particular decision than the other, that's where we go. But we've never had, a, never ever ever have we had a time in the four years where we just butted heads and you know we're really against each other's opinion, which is it's incredible. But I think. Um, yeah, I couldn't imagine doing it without Gemma. So I don't want to say we're lucky because we work very, very hard, yeah. but um, very lucky to have that relationship that I think will be very hard for a single you know, founder to have that same support without an equal co-founder. And what traits do you think are required in co-founders to be able to successfully adopt something like what you and Gemma have done so successfully? I think compromise and mm. accepting feedback is a really big one. So we're so open with each other. You know, we don't get precious because we know that without feedback, you can't grow. Yeah. So, you know, whilst it might hurt when somebody else points out something that you could have done better, especially if you're sleep deprived or, you know, had a really hard week, you should always um, take that on board because if they didn't care, they wouldn't have told you. And like I said, you can't grow unless you look for ways to improve. And we all have room for improvement. <laughs> yeah, amazing. That's really, really great advice for the uh, listeners out there on the podcast. So winding the clock back again, you started uh, Diversity City Careers in 2015 with Gemma. And um, it says here that you launched with a group of flagship employers, people like IBM, EMC, uh, ThoughtWorks, Origin, uh, Lang O'Rourke, Minter Edelson. So you launched with a, a group of really impressive customers and advocates uh, for diversity city careers. So, uh, what was the process like building the company in the early days? And how did you get to a point where you actually launched with these people as your partners? It's not easy for a, a startup to come out um, saying that they've got all these amazing customers from day one. Yeah, um, we moved really quickly. So in February, Gemma um, had the idea, I think it was in January, we had a chat in February, we'd already secured the domain, started, um, uh, we in the beginning, we basically rented a website. So it was like a jobs board that you could, you know, you didn't have to pay for creating it. You could um, essentially rent it. So we spun that up, but we it was very customised. So in May, we had launched the website, so May um, that same year, and by then had the customers. So I looked after the marketing side of things, and Gemma was very heavily involved in that. She did most of the sales. So it was a matter of reaching out to some of our existing networks, but also Gemma did a lot of call calling. So, you know, I don't think we had an existing relationship with all those companies. So it was a matter of talking about our mission, talking about what we stand for, and just finding some of the advocates that would come on board. So you've essentially launched an MVP in a sense, <laughs> and you, you followed the, the tried and tested technique of you know, building a, a product with low cost at the start to see if see if it would scale essentially. A hundred percent. We've um we've only now actually um more recently built our own platform. So we built our own platform for the UK launch last year, but just bought on Australian content on there earlier this year. So MVP one hundred percent of the way. And um so the growth continued in twenty sixteen with with Dropbox, Accenture, BOQ getting on the platform, and in twenty seventeen uh. Work 180 actually won the Victorian Innovation Minister's Diversity Award. Um, and we're also winners of the 2017 and 2016 Leaders in Advertising Award in the uh, Tech Diversity Award. So I'd say you've, from what I can see, experienced a lot of growth in 2016 and 2017. Uh, and in 2018, you decided to rebrand from Diversity City, City Careers to Work 180. What happened in those three years that let you down the path of finally deciding to, to rebrand the company? And uh, what happened in those intervening years? How, how did the company evolve to get to that point to becoming Work 180? Sure. So a few questions in there. Yeah, a lot um, of questions. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. The first one, um, I think we realized very quickly that diverse city careers was very hard to spell out on the phone, especially when you're trying to spell out the email address. Sure. People got very confused. So we actually, between that, rebranded to DCC Jobs because people were calling us that. Um, we decided to rebrand to Work 180 when we launched, decided to launch in the UK and the US. And the reason for that was because 
we wanted to have something really um, with a strong story around what we stood for. And the reason that we chose Work 180 is because on the candidate side, we've done a 180 degree twist on the way people apply. So generally speaking, you will just apply your credentials mm. and then um, the company will, the employer will decide if they want to talk to you. We're flipping it completely. So the companies are supplying their credentials transparently on our website and then you can select whether you would like to apply with them. So power to the job seeker. With the um, employers, they're doing a 180 degree shift because of all the policy changes that we have seen um, happen. And so that probably answers your other question around the biggest differences and the changes for us was that once we had reached a number of employers who have transparently exposed their policies on the site, others starting to take started to take notice and then change their policies to essentially compete with each other, you could say. Um, we also introduced a number of questions. So, for example, in 2018, we introduced the question around do you or don't you pay superannuation on mm. paid parental leave? Did you know that it's not mandatory? Oh, it's not? No. Yeah. So, you go on a holiday to have a... You go on, on holiday, you get your super. You go and have a baby, which is, in my experience, the last thing away from a holiday. You don't get your super. And huh. then there's a massive gap where women retire with nearly 50% less super than men. So we're like, what the, hey, yeah. what's happening here? Let's put that question on the criteria. BHP was the first company that year to come out and say, you know what, we're paying super on all parental leave for our employees. And that was huge. And just to give you an idea, back then we probably um, had about 5% of the companies pay super. It's now higher than 20%. And wow. all the new startups that come on board with us, they copy our policies, which we've developed because we now know what the, you know, the best practice looks like. And they essentially just introduce, um, there's no minimum tenure, so you don't need to be employed for um, say 12 months before you can access paid parental leave, which is the average. Some companies make you wait 24 months. And they're the companies that are missing out on amazing talent because some women want to have a baby, say, nine months or 12 months. Does it really matter if you want the best employees? So we introduced that question to the criteria as well and started seeing companies um, reduce the minimum tenure or drop it completely. So Microsoft have removed their minimum tenure altogether. Wow. Yep. Um, and we've recently had one amazing company, which I keep talking about, join... Um, they're called Reward Gateway and they offer 52 weeks paid parental leave um, for primary That's carers. That's amazing. Isn't it? So you don't have to worry weeks. at all. 52 weeks paid. The highest we've seen prior to that was 26 weeks. So we don't allow anyone on the website that's got less than um, six weeks paid mm. parental leave. So there's minimum benchmarks in place. And um, yeah, we realised ourselves that when we were still bootstrapped, we were 11 staff and we could introduce six weeks paid parental leave. So we saw no reason why any other company, 10 staff or over, couldn't do that as well. Mm. And we actually lost some customers when we increased our benchmarks because they didn't, um, I guess, subscribe to that, um, uh, I guess, idea of offering that to their staff. Mm. That's actually a good segue to my next question, which is, you know, did a lot of these companies, as you were introducing these criteria onto, onto your platform, did a lot of these companies push back strongly on, um, I guess, the best practices that you were implementing? And what were their reactions to the change that you were advocating for? Uh, only that handful that I mentioned. Um, usually, uh, they value because they value the advice. For example, Microsoft um, didn't realize that they didn't have stillbirth included in their paid parental leave. And we found out through our community, through one of the fathers actually, that there's six stillbirths a day in Australia. So that was an amazing story in terms of what change we could make through our network. So the first company we contacted was John Holland, and they introduced that into their policy and also became um, advocates themselves helping other endorsed employers over the phone to develop their policies. Um, Zero was next, the accounting app, so James over there um, championed this and it took him three days to do it and he said to me, you know, I wouldn't work anywhere else where it would take longer and James actually sent us their policy which we're allowed to share with other endorsed employers. So you know, Microsoft implemented the policy very quickly as well and they said to us, you know, we just didn't realise, it's not something that we thought of, yet we would love to, uh, we don't want any employee going through the, literally the worst time of their life, going through policies and w trying to figure out whether or not I still get my entitlement because there's horror stories out there where women have been actually told that, you know, you have to repay the um, that parental leave or it's cancelled because you've had a stillbirth. Wow. So um, I'd say that majority are very welcoming um, of that fact and we actually built a tool called the HR Health Check which has sped all that up. So all you do wow. is put in your policies, it spits out a report how you compare to your 
peers and then they're using it, the employers are using it as a really good business tool builder, kind of, I'm sorry, business case builder to go up to their, you know, leadership teams and say, hey, did you know that we're really, you know, below average in our industry, for example? Yeah. And um, what effect have you seen your new policies and your new advocation for all these um, great policies um, have on the employees themselves? Have any women come up to you to say, you know, what a, what a change you've made in their lives? And, uh, you know, what are some of the customer stories that really stick out to you um, in terms of change you've made? Yeah, sure. I've got one of my recent favorites. Well, actually, she's been in this role for about four months, which is really nice because obviously, you know, it's going well. But um, this lady, I sometimes I pick up the phone and just call our applicants and I rang this particular lady, we're actually doing a case study on her as well, and she said to me that um, your job site gave me the confidence to reject an inflexible job offer. And I said, what do you mean? And she applied with another company, not on our site, and they had extended a job offer to her. She was a software developer as well, so a role that could definitely be done flexibly. Also a new mum, and she wanted to have one day a week working from home. Anyway, this company said, there's no way we can do that. You need to be in the office nine to five, five days a week. She said thanks but no thanks and then she went through our website and she was checking to see who had a tick in the box of you know we're open to discussing flexible working up front chose nab the bank and she told me that she had an interview with them the next day so at first i actually panicked because i thought i better get in touch with my contact there make sure that they are going to discuss flexible working because you know it's a giant company anyway my email didn't make it to the hiring manager in time but that didn't matter she got the job, she's working flexibly, she's super happy. So you can imagine how much that means to me as a parent that went through, like if, if she didn't have that opportunity, she'd probably be settling for that other role and you know not spending time with her baby and that company is now missing out on her talent. It's kind of like a perfect story of illustrating the point that you know got to t- treat, treat your staff right and you'll benefit from it as well. Yeah. Our own staff, for example, I caught up with our um, couple of team members from the tech team in Brisbane on Monday, they told me that their previous boss didn't believe in flexible working and they're like, oh, you're going to go work from home because we're all remote. I'll have fun doing that kind of thing. You'll never get anything done or whatever misconception they had. They both told me that they do way more work now, way more productive. So I'm just kind of laughing on the inside about the ex-boss and what he's missing out on, you know? Wow. That's an amazing story. And uh, if you wanted to learn more, could we just hop on your website to hear more of these customer stories? Yeah, yeah. So jump on the, um, if you navigate to the, in the top bar, there's employers, employers blog. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can find the HR health check and encourage your HR manager to do it so they can see how they compare. Um, So Work180 raised capital in uh, 2018. But before that, from 2015 to 2018 or early 2018, the company was bootstrapped by yourself and Gemma effectively. How do you, for all the listeners out there who are bootstrapping their companies right now, what's the ingredient for success when you're bootstrapping a company? What's it like bootstrapping a company? Well, we both, it was really scary at first because we had to cut, we had six figure salaries and they basically got, at first there was no money at all, then it was a quarter of that. So it was a big shock in that sense. We also didn't have any savings, so it's not like we saved up Uh, We got $20,000 investment from Gemma's father, who's also working with us. So he believed in us from day one. And most of that obviously went on, you know, on the first um, uh, bit of technology investment and so on. You have to be super, super clever. And one thing that I've discovered um, since, you know, obviously getting a bigger marketing budget is... Some of the things that you test out when you have no money, say social media or content or running events or all the things that you can do without any investment mm. are still, I would say, the best kind of generators of building, um, you know, a community and building fans. So instead of, you know, I always think about impressions, you can have a thousand impressions and we have done billboards and had great success with that, but would you rather a thousand impressions or a hundred fans? And the way you build a hundred fans isn't necessarily by pouring money into, you know, Google cost per click campaigns or huge marketing TV ads or anything like that. So um, that was a really interesting lesson to learn because uh, we did have an offer of investment early on that we rejected because okay. they wanted us to um, remove the criteria altogether. Yeah. So, so effectively stripping the company from its soul. A hundred percent. And it was a bit hard. We thought about for about five seconds because back then we didn't know if we had, you know, food to eat the next day. But then we realized that, you know, if we do that, who are we? So, um, but 
I remember before we realised that was a side um, condition, I had worked out this marketing plan. I was going to spend $350,000 on all these different things. And I'm kind of glad I didn't get that money because I would have blown it. Instead, I had to figure out what can I do with, you know, $100 of my own money. And you treat that very differently to, you know, when you've got heaps and heaps of money coming in that's not, you know, your own kind of cash. So lots of lessons learned. Um, and I think that's what everybody should do, like just do it on a shoestring budget, see what you can achieve and then invest carefully into something bigger. So what was the turning point for Work 180 to finally go, we're ready for investment and we're ready to take on growth capital? What was that turning point? I guess, you know, we had so much feedback both from the candidates and employers that they wanted, um, you know, this was working. We were getting great case studies. We had um, customers renewing. We also had customers asking us, you know, when are you going overseas? So the UK pool uh, was very much driven by our customers over there and they're just taking off like wildfire at the moment. Um, so in the beginning, I think when we first started pitching, it might have been not, not too early, but it was really hard because um, it was still early on, for example, and then that, that investor really kind of turned us off. Jim also had a couple of experiences which were really n not nice at all with um, sexual harassment, mm -hmm. um, in fact, which we've spoken about publicly okay. before yep. um, in the investor community. And when we decided to go at it again, we actually did the – or Gemma actually joined the Startmate um, accelerator program and that's when we first met Kim Jackson uh, of Skip Capital, Lassian's Venture Fund and I guess that you know kind of catapulted everything because Kim was a great advisor and introduced us to lots of other people as well. The accelerator was really good to do. Um, the mentors held us very accountable and they, they pushed us to that next stage as well um, because they had very strict goals and, and deadlines that we had to meet so that was a really good exercise to go through and after that that's you know when the fundraising just kind of took off. Right. Wow. And um, how would you describe the fundraising process? Was it a long, arduous process as well? So for full disclosure, that was all Gemma. So yep. she is incredibly amazing. And I remember once I said to her, you know, like people have companies that you know, focus on helping you raise funds. And I remember people would contact us and say, do you need any help? And she did it all herself. Um, and she said to me, oh, you know, you can just anyone can read a few books and listen to a few podcasts. I'm like, no, 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 no. We can all listen to podcasts and read books, but actually doing it is another whole story. So, um, yeah, Gemma did an amazing job, you know, pitching to all these different people that um, would have been very tough um, because the questions that they would throw at her are not ones that you can, you know, if you've never done it before, it's very, um, could be very, very daunting, but she was incredible. And, um, yeah, I was just amazed at how how quickly she achieved it as well and also while still focusing on her core role yeah. in, in sales primarily at our company. Sure. And I actually do recall reading, um, going back to the experience that Gemma had while raising capital and the discrimination she faced. I actually do remember reading about that at one point in time. And um, I don't think, you know, I guess you were one of the first companies that publicly called out the investor community for that kind of behavior. Is it something that you're still seeing within the technology community here in Australia? And uh, what can we do to, to fix that or at least change things for the better? Yeah, it's a tough one because it's such an unregulated, you know, industry, isn't it? So it's not like um, we could, it would be nice to have a Work 180 for the investment funds, for example, so you can actually have people um, talk about their experiences. So we did talk to the um, Victorian government about this and I think they did implement a bit of a, um, not a hotline or a helpline where you know, people can report inappropriate behaviour, which I think really needs to exist. And if that that's what's happening, then those people need to be shut down, you know. But it, it is very difficult because, like I said, it's not very highly regulated. But I think people need to speak up about it for sure. Did that motivate you to want to push even harder with Work 180? Because this goes back to the core of the problem being the, you know, underrepresentation of women in the technology scene. So I'm guessing that was a bit of a, a catalyst for, for you to continue, you know, pushing harder to, to grow your company as well. Am I right? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, you can't, um, you can get upset by those things, but you can also use it as fuel to, right. you know, fuel your fire essentially. Yeah, great. And um, since raising capital, you've then, you've then expanded to the UK and the US, which for a lot of companies, it's quite an arduous and daunting process, but you seem to have done it fairly successfully um, for what I can see and from what our team can see here. So what was the process like ex expanding into the UK and the US and how did you pick the markets to expand into those? Yeah, sure. So UK, um, 
was, like I mentioned before, hugely driven by our customers. Yep. Um, they also have recently um, mandated that companies over 250 staff report on their gender pay gap. So we actually expose that information on our website as well, which I'd love to see Australian companies start to do. But so there's a lot of push there. Um, and the policies are very similar across our employers. So it was quite, um, you know, a natural segue for us to get in there with the likes of Microsoft, um, HSBC, uh, Atlassian as mm. well, which were one of the first um, flagship group members. And it's now been um, just over a year. We have a team of five there at the moment. And if I could recommend one thing that other founders do is make sure that you get out there and be on the ground. So you can't expect, and I think, you know, there's been a lot of research as well that companies perform a lot better when the founders open up a new territory rather than, you know, employing someone to do that. There was a lot of difficult kind of um, the, the setting up banks and all the financial and legal stuff is a bit of a um, minefield in the UK and um, US as well. So make sure you have somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, don't try and do it yourself because you'll probably, you know, take three times as long and potentially make a mistake. Um, and then we did make a few trips out there and I'm going there in a week's time. Can't wait to see the UK team, meeting the clients face to face, you know, doing events. It's just incredible. So, yeah. What about the US? What was the, uh, the pull? There? Very similar. So US, we are doing like a soft launch in September. We've already got a flagship group. Again, Microsoft, HSBC, Atlassian, Facebook is also on board. Um, wow, congratulations. Thank you. We also have, just to you know, diversify the portfolio, Brown Foreman, who are an alcohol company. Um, they're across all three regions and they've got amazing you know, support as well within their organizations. Um, again, you know, the pool is over there because of the company's headquarters and they need help as we all know so it's quite easy to showcase the companies that are doing above and beyond because last time I checked um, pregnancy was like part of their disability scheme you know so that's very 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 archaic way of looking at 50% of the population you know who can be working and be, being way more involved in the workforce. Are there big differences in policies across Australia, the UK, and the US in terms of that gender representation or, or trying to fix a gender gap um, in terms of you know the the paid uh, parental leave? Do you, did you see a lot of differences between those different countries? What I noticed the most, for example, between Australia and UK, is that a lot of the companies don't recognise gender neutral. Um, policies so they will have maternity and paternity leave and we're saying to them what about if it's a same-sex couple you know and two men and they want to adopt a baby why should they what, what are they going to be applying for maternity leave that's not inclusive at all and we have one amazing company called fund apps so they've gone and they've made it all gender neutral um, and they've enhanced their yeah parental leave schemes a lot so we're kind of using them as a spotlight on a what a progressive employer looks like and that's probably one of the biggest things I've seen flexibility as well a lot of people talk about it but in fact you know they're so kind of not really open to flexible working arrangements or job sharing everyone's having issues attracting women in technology uh, women in leadership and they're pretty much leaving for the same reasons that they are you know regardless of where you live and that's lack of career progression or poor parental leave support or no flexibility when re you return from having children um, or managers that are looking at job ads um, and wanting to have you know a million prerequisites when really if you kind of half that you'll get amazing people applying mm. um, that are not you know in intimidated to apply because you've asked for a million and one things that you don't actually need so there's a multitude of different challenges, but they're very, very similar from what I, you know, have seen over the last few years. Okay, you mentioned prior to starting this podcast that you've since raised an additional two million dollars. So, firstly, congratulations, that's amazing news. And uh, secondly, what do you plan on doing with that new capital raise? Yeah, sure. And two point two, sorry, if it wouldn't 2 be exactly yeah. amazing. Yeah, <laughs> even better. And then again, that's all kudos to Gemma who raised that and um, did that just before she had her first baby boy, which is amazing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so that will be going on um, building out our tech team and also improving our platform. So there's a lot of feedback that we've had. Um, we've got our head of UX who joined us from Seek recently. So lots of domain knowledge um, in terms of, you know, what the platform, what a good platform looks like, but also taking into account the different UX research she did with our community, what they want, what they don't want. And it's very, very different to a traditional jobs board because we are candidate first. Uh, we are making sure that um, women, women's biggest problem, for example, at the moment and biggest kind of bugaboo is the fact that they don't get feedback. Mm. 
So, you know, you apply for a job, you don't know what's happened to it. People say they'll give you feedback and they don't. And, for example, we, we really pride ourselves on always providing feedback if the person wants it, responding in a very timely manner. And people really appreciate that. So one of the tools that we're building out is a feedback loop where women will be able to um, opt into a service and provide their feedback throughout the interview process, um, even beyond getting hired. So, you know, for example, is there breastfeeding rooms like you thought there was? Are there career progression opportunities? Are people working flexibly? So taking it to that next level and um, making sure that once a woman applies on Work 180, they're really taken care of. Because at the moment, we've got the policies listed, but you know, how do you go beyond that and take it to that next level? So that's just one project that we're working on. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. And uh, so do you now, you're now going through a period of extraordinary growth. You mentioned that you've crossed the 50 uh, team member threshold for your company, which is... Soon to be. Soon yes. to be. Yep. <laughs> which is an amazing benchmark. A lot of people say that you know, a company looks very different when it's just the founders versus when it's a 10-person company or a 25-person company. And then again, at a 50-person company, how, how do you maintain that culture within Work 180 as you're scaling your team? And have you noticed any differences as the teams scaled in terms of the dynamic and work culture and all that other you stuff? You know, I was just thinking about this the other day. So we use Slack. Okay. Um, probably familiar with that. Yep. And I feel like our Slack is getting more and more people are engaging on there more and more and I remember when we crossed over from Yammer to Slack I was a little bit worried because I've worked in, within organisations before where it just didn't take off for us it's our main means of communication we also catch up on Zoom as a whole team once a week and all the other teams catch up together because we're all 100% remote we work from all over the oh, world oh wow that's amazing yeah we, we need that but it's built such a sense of camaraderie so to give you an example the other day that happened that kind of made me realise how great our culture is and support people are is um, somebody was working on a presentation because this was really cool one of our customers told us that we outperformed other job boards between four to eight times they told us that we could talk oh, about wow. publicly yep so of course we we're busy presenting a presentation on, on all that good stuff and then somebody pointed out on slack that maybe we could present the information in a bit more visually engaging way then somebody else jumped in from another department and said, oh, yeah, you should use this this tool to you know, present it. Then a developer jumped in and said, here's the percentage. I've done the calculations for you. And then another person jumped in and said, send it to me. I'll do it for you. And then there was like 31 comments on one thread. And I realised that if you were in an office, you would never put your hand up and go, I'm struggling with this presentation. Can someone help me? And have five people from five different departments come to you and help. So first of all, I think that's amazing you know, cross-team collaboration where people feel comfortable and also care about each other. And second of all, um, just, yeah, how open how open it is and how helpful people are because even though they're not next to each other in the office and also more productive, you know, you would not... It would be very unproductive to have five people crowd you yeah. and try and all help at the same time. So I think um, hiring people that are really behind our mission and explaining what it is... Uh, where we've come from, what we've achieved, also communicating the wins, you know, on a regular basis. We have one channel that's called Why We Do What We Do yeah. and it blows up every day. So either someone's changed the policy or they've introduced stillbirth into their parental leave or they're not even an endorsed employer but they're working on a business case, you know, and they're telling us about their progress or a woman finds a job or a man takes parental leave at a company where they've implemented gender-neutral parental leave. So that reminds people why we're here and also fosters that, you know, um, I guess, team mentality where we're all here for the same purpose and the rest kind of falls into place. I know it sounds simple, but, you know, that's... For us, it's probably a bit easier than others because of that strong social purpose. Yeah, that's amazing. It seems like you've got a really strong team culture that you foster even through such a period of, of rapid growth. And um, I, I just want to point out that one of the things that um, we've read that Work 180 does is that you host a annual super... Super Daughter Day to encourage young girls to get into STEM. Uh, we had Code Like a Girl CEO Ellie Watson on the podcast here, and it seems like you know that's that's becoming an increasingly strong area of focus for the technology community to encourage STEM mm -hmm. um, for for women in the workplace and for for girls growing up to know that STEM is a viable career option that they shouldn't let traditional um, constraints. I guess weigh them down to get into the industry. Uh, what's your vision for this Super Daughter Day? What effects have you seen 
um, on the people who come for these events? Oh, it's incredible. So we started that um, in our first year and we wanted to do something for International Women's Day. We didn't want to do another kind of, you know, expensive lunch and so on. We wanted to do something that made an impact. So we thought we'd just invite some girls into Microsoft in Queensland and um, within a couple of hours, 120 girls signed up. Wow. So we're like, wow, yeah, this this has got legs. Um, and they rocked up and we had um, someone was on a hovercraft, somebody bought in um, some coding games and someone had virtual reality goggles so it was really kind of um, unstructured activities but the girls came with their parents we organized cupcakes you know they had a ball in a day next year um, people started asking us can you do the same in Sydney and this is us being a startup you know right um, very busy at the time um, can you do something in Adelaide can you do something in Canberra can you do basically we said all right let's do the whole of Australia why not chuck in New Zealand and this is again like trying to survive as a startup it was very difficult to organize a huge event like that but it was amazing and when you saw the little girls who were aged you know five to twelve come in with their parents and their faces light up and you know um, it was incredible the next year they all dressed up as superheroes, wow. which was even cuter because, you know, by then we were selling – the tickets were only $25. We had a lot of tickets allocated as well to underprivileged, you know, children um, because we needed to ensure, like, the fee was so that, you know, we have um, – enough catering and we know who's coming and so on um some parents were even complaining when we sold out of tickets that we should have made them more expensive funny right, enough okay um and then we actually got sponsorship last year began so got some serious sponsors behind us the likes of um jacobs um the new south wales government as well so rms um uh, lots and lots of other tech companies came on board as well and we took it a lot more seriously and so we've had about 3,000 girls come through the program so far and the results are amazing. So 94% of the parents that we surveyed um, said that their girls are more interested in STEM mm, now wow. after coming. Yeah, so if you imagine That's it's huge. now been four years in a row, you know, if they start at five... They're now nine years old. They'll be going to high school. They'll be choosing STEM because they hung out with 300 other little girls dressed up as a superhero, playing with technology and, you know, doing robotics and coding and all that kind of fun stuff. So we see a huge impact on that. UK is now doing theirs. So we've moved it to October for International Day of the Girl. US wants to do theirs as well. And we just, we have to pace ourselves, but there's so much interest. And by involving our, you know, partners and endorsed employers who are supporting us both, you know, financially, but also um, by presenting on the day and running the little workshops and so on, it's just grown like wildfire. And it's really exciting because I don't think there's a lot of things happening at high school level, which is great, but um, stereotypes form as young as four. So girls will be thinking, um, I can be a doctor or a mathematician at that age and then they turn five or they go to school and they're like, no, that's for boys. So that's why we're working so hard at that very early stages. Right. It's, it's amazing that you've actually adopted this since the early days of your company. And, uh, you know, I, I, what was the spark behind it? Where did the idea come from? Again, just let's just do it. Um, yep. And I think <laughs> at first we're like, what are we going to do for International Women's Day? Right, let's do that. And then we saw how much interest that was and it was just, it was huge. And in the end, I remember... I it was so hard for us to pull it off but we just couldn't not do it yeah you know you look at the photos you're like how can we not run it again when we're getting all these messages and emails from people saying when is it when is it like are you running why isn't there enough room and people got pissed off with us because we couldn't pull off um Canberra this year and we're like well if anyone wants to help help you know can't do this alone so it's kind of like the demand is there and finally we're at this stage where we can actually do it properly so next year we can hire a venue in Canberra if no one will give us a free one. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of getting yeah. to that stage where you grow something and you, you involve the right people, you structure it properly and then you can deliver it, it to even more people. That's really cool. That's really, really cool. And, um, you know, we, we talked a bit about startups and um, uh, the fact that you're working with large companies as well. Do you find that you know startups are more progressive or less progressive than the corporates oh. is there a difference across the two different segments of companies it depends which policy we look at mm. um and also who you're working with as well so i um one of my favorite customers is um there's a lady called jane bithell who works at nbn and we've got a wonderful story where there was a another lady called trudy and she was on facebook and she was just like calling out to a friend saying i'm not looking on job boards anymore sick of wasting my time i need something flexible but also she was a senior uh, manager in marketing also something rewarding at the same time somebody said check out work 180 she joined our facebook group which is a private group of nearly three thousand women who are really passionate about what we do and then jane from nbn connected with trudy and 
Trudy's now she Trudy lives in a remote town. There's only 600 people. She's now working at MBN, and she's like the biggest ambassador for flexible working. So, yeah. you know, people like Jane are really making things like that happen. She's talking to so many people that come through Work 180 looking for work where they might have not previously been even looked at because they might have come from another country, and people just, you know, judging them on their name, on their resume, and so on. So, somebody like Jane will make a big splash at any company. Then you've got the likes of Buildkite, who've got 26 weeks paid parental leave. There are only about eight people at the moment. Oh, wow. Their CEO told me the other day that there's no job at our company that can't be done remotely. So with that kind of leadership at the helm, you know, and then you've got your large, huge organisations that haven't qualified to work with us because they don't have any paid parental leave. Right. So it's like, you know, there's no kind of common thread that I think it depends on the leadership and the mm. people driving it. Um, We've had great changes in implemented at companies where there was only two people building a business case and pushing it through, you know? Wow. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a good note to, to wrap up the podcast on. I just have one last question, and that's, you know, if, if someone wanted to learn more about Work180 or to even use Work180 for their hiring or to even uh, look for a job as well, uh, what should they do? So if you're looking for a job, head to work180.co, that's CO. Yep. And same thing, you know, if you're looking to hire, head over there, have a look at the HR Health Check. So you can Google Work 180 HR Health Check or head to the bottom of our website. And if you're a HR manager, perform the HR Health Check. It will tell you if you qualify to work with us or it might tell you where you will need to improve. And then also we have amazing people that will walk you through the process, that will share policies, put you in touch with other endorsed employers that will also be willing to help, um, even if they're competing which is really amazing. So yeah, all of those options are available. That's great. Congratulations on your growth, Valeria. Um, we look forward to continuing to watch your journey. And thank you so much for being on the podcast.